Well, welcome to this talk, Sunday the 18th of April, and what a varied picture it is around the world. Now, let's start off with some news from the UK. just want to start off with the COVID uh, symptom study app here. Uh, this is the people, 28,604 people who are currently predicted to have symptomatic COVID in the UK. So going down still quite nicely. Um, this is the number of new confirmed cases today, according to the symptom study, so 1,250. And this shows the, uh, the trajectory. So low in summer went up, down with the tiered system, up with the new variant, down with the lockdown and probably starting about here, down with the vaccinations as well, and now carrying on this downward trajectory as a result of the lockdown and the vaccination programme. So um, useful to keep an eye on that data. It's a good, good, good trend from that. Now, Joint Committee on Vaccination. Uh, Joint Committee on Vaccination and Immunisation Pregnancy Advice. Now, the citing data from the Centres for Disease Control in the States here, do check that out. That's the link to the CDC there, and that's the link for the, uh, the government site here where they comment on pregnancy. Now, it turns out uh, that 90,000 pregnant women have been vaccinated, mainly through the mRNA vaccines, including Pfizer and Bio, uh, uh, the Pfizer, BioNTech and the Moderna National Institutes of Health vaccine in the United States. So what, what the uh, UK authorities have done is they've said, well, let's go on that data and we'll, we'll, we'll make recommendations based on the data that we know, which I mean, does, make, does make sense. So they're saying without safety concerns being raised, that's the direct quote from the UK government site, uh, preferable for pregnant women in the UK to be offered Pfizer, BioNTech or Moderna vaccines where available. Now, what they're saying here is they're not saying one's better than the other, but they're just saying this is where the data is available. So if the data is there and it indicates safety in this group of people, um, then, then, yeah, that, that makes perfect. That makes perfect sense to me, I must say. Uh, there's no evidence to suggest that the vaccines are unsafe for pregnant women, but more research is needed. Well, a bit pathetic saying that, isn't it? O always more research is needed. Uh, but still advise pregnant women should discuss the risk and benefits of vaccination with their clinician. Bit of a cop-out. Would have expected a stronger statement, but um, that's, uh, that's, that's what they've given us. But, you know, that, that's, that's now on the official government website, so... The, the, the thing is, of course, uh, the, the, the clinicians go by the official government website and the official government website is saying talk to your clinician. So it's a bit it's a bit bit circular. But there you go. Um, but but it is clear advice. I'm not I'm not knocking it. Uh, it's now made its way into the green book for the references. So this is the chapter in the green book. The green book is the definitive text uh, official publication for vaccination in the UK and that is the chapter on the COVID vaccines. Quite an interesting read actually. I haven't gone into it in detail because we've covered most of it on different videos already but, but interesting. Now let's look at some US data. Um, so well it kind of speaks for itself really doesn't it? Um, I mean slight increases in, in cases. Um, seven day moving average, not far under 70,000 new cases per day in the United States. And when we look at the deaths on this uh, graphic as well, well, again, um, they do appear to be leveling off. So although the vaccination program in the States is doing so well, I think we have to conclude that uh, guards in the United States in many areas have been let down. People think this is all over, but it's not yet. People are still dying. And if we look at the hospitalization data from the States as well, again, we see it's gone up. It's up 4.6% in the past seven days. Okay, it's not a dramatic increase, but this is still a lot of people actually in hospital, 37,000 people in hospital in the States. Okay, it's down 69.9% since the, the, the peak week, but that's not saying too much because that was pretty high, to be quite honest. So 4.6 up. So, um, you know, cer cer certainly a way to go here. And uh, behaviour really needs to be maintained for some weeks yet. Um, so that, that was from the United States, just a quick update. Now, Brazil. Uh, Vinictus has written from Brazil. Speaking from Brazil here, the situation is absolutely out of control. There are thousands of people dying without ever getting the chance to be treated, he says. 
Um, we need help. Our government simply doesn't do anything about it. I personally know of more than 15 people that died from COVID. Uh, our heart goes out to this situation, of course. Now, we did look at Brazil yesterday. Uh, deaths in Brazil are now up to um, 371,000, very high death rates. But I was reading an interesting article in the BBC, deaths in the under nines in Brazil, 852 official figures, including 518 under the age of one year. Now, um, I don't think there's any need to um, elaborate on just how uh, just how terrible this, this is. We'll just keep to the numbers. Um, we all know to varying degrees and with varying degrees of experience what tragedies we're describing here. Um, 0.58% Brazil, of Brazil's, uh, when the deaths were 345,000, which were, were in deaths under the age of uh, nine years old. Um, so clearly this number's a bit out of date now, but that was that was the figure then. This works out at more than 2,000 children. And not all apparently, and it's hard, it's hard to give data, but this is the multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children. And we have talked about this multi-system inflammatory this multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children quite a few times. Um, it develops up to six weeks after the acute infection and causes severe inflammation in the in different organs of children. And this does seem to be a particular problem, this combined with other causes of childhood death from COVID in, in Brazil. Um, Dr. Fatima Marinho, Marinho. Uh, anyway, she's from the University of Sao Paulo following this kind of thing. Childhood deaths are underreported, she says. Uh, Ten times more deaths by unexplained respiratory syndrome than in previous years from Dr. Fatima. Um, large numbers. So actual deaths, she estimates at 2,060 children under nine years old, including just over 1,300 babies. This is just terrible. Now, the factors that we that talked about in Brazil, high, high case numbers. So even although there's a very low proportion, um, a very low proportion of cases, um, a very small proportion of children get severe disease and a very small proportion of those get severe disease because there's high numbers of cases, that percentage inevitably goes up. So that is one factor. Limited testing in children in Brazil is another. Uh, poverty and access to care is another factor. Crowded poor accommodation in the poor areas and uh, background malnutrition. Now, malnutrition in children is just the worst thing for immunity. If children are malnourished, they get all sorts of uh, intercurrent infections. And of course, COVID is one of those intercurrent infections around at the moment. So malnutrition, a factor. Um, also more common in dark skin children, which is related to poverty, but could also be related to vitamin D, which I haven't seen mentioned by the Brazilian authorities. Late diagnosis in care. Very important that these children who are developing complications or multisystem inflammatory syndrome get to paediatricians as soon as possible. And there's no vaccinations yet in Brazil in the under 16s. Now, Dr. Fatima goes on to say something remarkably interesting here. Differential presentation in children. Now, the I know it's only one story, but the BBC did a full write-up of one child and because their symptoms were not typical, that they weren't tested at an early stage and tragically went on to die. I've put the link there to read the article. V very upsetting read indeed. Um, but Dr. Fatima is here saying there's differential presentations that he's putting doctors off a bit. So a child has a lot more diarrhoea, a lot more abdominal pain and chest pain than the classic COVID picture, she says. And I'm going to show you the UK guidelines as well. And to be quite honest, this isn't really reflected in the UK guidelines. So this is the UK guidelines from the Royal College of Paediatrics and Child Health. Check, check on the links there for yourself. That is the actual link to this graphic I'm about to show you. Now, I'm not saying there's graphics. Well, of course, I wouldn't contradict the, the Royal College of Paediatricians. That They are the experts. They know way about, more about it than anyone else. Um, but that is their latest uh, documentation. Advice for parents, carers during coronavirus. And to be quite honest, a lot of these sort of red flag things that they talk about here uh, are related to uh, non-COVID conditions. So um, the Brazilian experience would seem to indicate that it would be worth putting gastrointestinal conditions. 
A child has a lot more diarrhea, a lot more abdominal pain and chest pain than the classic COVID picture, according to, to Fatima. So, but this is always reliable reading from the uh, Royal College of Pediatrics and Child Health. And uh, if you're a parent, it wouldn't do any harm to print that out and put it on your fridge, would it? Um, do no harm at all to do that. So, um, but interesting that it doesn't mention the gastrointestinal um, things that can be associated with uh, with, with COVID. But o o always good to bear in mind things that, um, well, it wouldn't do a lot of nurses any harm to put this up in A&E departments, to be quite honest. Um, you know, th this is just basic, useful material. Um, if, if perhaps not that specific to COVID, but they say it's for use... Um, uh, dur during coronavirus and so so th that's what we have to go by and, uh, and most of it is well it, it is of course it's brilliant it's brilliant D don't get the impression I'm doing this down I'm not this is excellent and it's what we have to go by and uh, this is written by the people who spend their life studying this kind of thing so well, well, well worth downloading that sticking it on the fridge now um, we kind of ran out of time and energy yesterday <laughs> um, for chili. So let's look at chili today. Now, I've been asked so many questions about chili. Um, lots and lots of cases in chili, but the vaccination rate's really high. What is going on? What is going on? So a bit difficult to understand it. So let's try and unpick uh, the situation in, in chili at the moment. It is a useful case study, population about 19 million. Now, Chile, uh, certainly compared to the countries around it, well-developed public health care system, remote area coverage and uh, well-practiced vaccination pathways. So their, PD, their ch childhood va vaccination program is well-practiced. Their uh, influenza vaccination program is well-practiced. So they kind of have the infrastructure and the people have, have the training and they have the delivery routes, <coughs> delivery routes over. I mean, Chile's down that left-hand side. It's Andean, isn't it? So, um, you know, they've got that kind of well accounted for um, in Chile. Um, now, so Israel's leading the vaccination program, then probably the UK, uh, then Chile, then the United States. Now, I know smaller countries are doing well, like in you know, United Arab, Arab Emirates, but they're, they're the larger countries. So doing remarkably well per capita, uh, better than the United States per capita at the moment. Uh, so 19 million population. Um, first dose at the moment seems to be uh, up to 7.5 million. Um, that seems pretty pretty high, but that, that that's great. It's, go, it's going really, really well. Second dose up to 5 million. So this is going really well, but why are the cases still high is the question. And here are the cases, uh, So as we see, they have been going up quite a lot recently. Now, to be fair, there's probably a bit of a downward trajectory just in the last week or two. But it's still a good question is why is the vaccination program going so well when the cases have still been going up? Well, let's look at some of the factors. Now, until recently, there's been quite a lot of pandemic fatigue. So people haven't been obeying the non-pharmaceutical interventions as well. Uh, there was so that's a factor. There was quite a lot of travel during the summer vacation, which was a bad idea. And of course, there's the new variant, particularly the P1 and probably the P2. And there's the Chinese vaccine. So what is going on with the Chinese vaccine? Notoriously, of course, not uh, published in uh, peer-reviewed literature for phase three clinical trials. But you just have to stick around for the result in that in a minute. Uh, Doctor Leona Fer Ferreira. Uh, now, she, she, she's an ITU doctor in this town here. Patients younger on average than during the first wave, she reports, which is concerning. Um, continuing to let people travel over uh, abroad was a grave error, she says. So the vaccines, unfortunately, the, not the vaccine, the, the, the various the variants of the virus have come in with the travellers. As we'll see, most of the vaccines come from China. Uh, it introduced new variants, which Chile has been slow to detect and contain. So the the uh, genomic sequencing in Chile, not where they'd like it to be. Now, um, let's go on to the Chinese vaccine now. And I think you're going to be pleasantly surprised. I, I was pleasantly surprised. Now, 80% of the vaccines given out in Chile have been uh, Sinovac's. 
is the company. Uh, CoronaVac is the name of the vaccine. Now, Chile has contracted for 60 million doses over three years, so good. Uh, but they've also got some, some deliverers of Pfizer, also good. Now, they followed up virtually half the population. They followed up 10.5 10 million people from February the 2nd to April the 1st. And during this time, 1.5 million had the first dose and uh, 2.5 million had the second dose. So you can see they've got what? They've got uh, three... Uh, We've got four, 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 four million people there, and so five and a half million, whatever, five, six and a half million as the control group. So um, they've got a control group of people that weren't vaccinated. I mean, it's not, it's not experiment, it's real world data, of course, but 1.5 million had the first dose and 2.5 million had the second dose. So this is the experimental group here and the rest left in this is the control group. So that's a pretty good... That's a pretty good uh, clinical trial, even though it's not a clinical trial, it's real world data. And the, the data was recorded two weeks after the second dose. Now, frustratingly, um, I couldn't find any data on how efficacious the vaccine was after the first dose. We think it's pretty low, but fr frustratingly couldn't get data on that. At least I couldn't, maybe you can find some. Uh, but two weeks after the second dose, now, the strategy here is uh, four weeks apart, uh, but two weeks after the second dose, so the primer dose, then 28 days later, the booster dose, 67% reduction in symptomatic disease. So much, much better than we've thought. We've seen figures as low as 50% 50, 50 for Chinese vaccines. So that is pretty good. Uh, but it gets better. Uh, deaths reduced by 80%. Hospitalizations reduced by 85%. ICU admissions really reduced by 89%. So not quite where we'd like to be, but wow, is that a lot better than nothing. So much, much better results based on millions of cases from, uh, we, we can only say that this relates to this particular vaccine, the, 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 the Sinovac's CoronaVac data. Although there is a few Pfizer's uh, thrown in there as well, to be fair. But it's most of the Chinese vaccine. Uh, now, all we're told is that the coverage was much lower only after one dose. So we don't know what the first dose is. Basically, it's not very good. This is two days after. This is uh, two weeks after the second dose. But I think you'll agree with me that that is pretty encouraging data. Given that without the Chinese vaccine, Chile would have had probably to wait for. Who knows? M many months, probably uh, to get enough vaccines to make a serious impression on its population. Um, so, but hospitals are still stretched. Uh, they're thinking about using a third dose of the vaccine, and there's been very stringent measures at the moment. Santiago and areas round about it are now uh, under pretty strict lockdown with pretty pr strict sanctions for, for breaching lockdown and because they have been alarmed by this great uh, increase in cases. But very slight reduction there as it just looks like the vaccination program starting to work. And because of these lockdown measures that they've reimposed in Chile, they will for sure start to work. So our prediction on this channel is that we're going to get a very nice, fairly rapid reduction in Chile as a result of the non-pharmaceutical interventions and as a result of vaccines. I say that because we know that the non-pharmaceutical interventions work. They've worked in the UK, they've worked in many countries. And from this data we've just looked at, we know that the vaccines will have an effect as well. Well, we don't know, but it's overwhelmingly likely the vaccines are going to have an effect as well in reducing transmission. That thing that people are always reluctant to seem reluctant to say that vaccines reduce transmission, but we believe that they do. Um, so where are we now in Chile? Uh, first dose, 40%. Second dose, 27% of the population. Excellent. Uh, now vaccinating down to 48-year-olds. Sharp decrease in over 70s in hospitalizations. Because of the lag time, of course, we've got to wait for two weeks after the second dose. And that only... So, it's, it's, so basically it's six weeks after the first dose, isn't it? So first dose, four weeks later, second do dose, two weeks after that, immunity um, is improved greatly improved so um starting to filter through to the older population first but sustained rise in the under 59s now as the vaccination goes down into this group i think we will see less people in that group being hospitalized as well so 
Um, it's not, it appears, to, I see why it appears to be a, a, a contradiction, but I think most of it is explained by uh, people letting their guard down too much. If you're listening in the United States, bear that in mind. If you're listening in the United Kingdom, bear that in mind. People letting their guard down too much that caused that re resumption of cases. Um, but it's also caused by the, the lag effect in the vaccines taking effect. Now, briefly, just before we finish today, India um, cases are still going up dramatically. Now, um, I'm actually worried about this new Indian double mutation that we looked at yesterday. And the reason I'm worried about it is we don't have good data on it. It could be, it could be a bad one. And the infection rate in India seems to indicate that it is as there is exponential increase in this particular variant in India. And we know that's true by comparing data from January uh, to April now. And this, you know, just fasten your seat bars a minute. This is just incredible. Um, as I checked on the data this morning, India is not on the UK red list of countries. So if you come in from India, you have to you can self isolate at home. I don't know how you get from the airport to home and you do three tests or something. I mean, it is just unbelievable how easy, how laxed it is, how lax the regulations are for people traveling from India with a new mutant, which could be absolutely devastating. We don't know yet, but they can come into the UK with comparative ease. I just find that appalling, and I really think the UK government should be acting on that as a matter of extreme urgency, because I am concerned about this new double mutation variant. Now, if it turns out my concerns are ill-founded, then what have we lost? A few weeks' inconvenience. Um, if it turns out that my concerns are founded, then, then this could uh, interfere with the efficacy of our vaccination programme. You know, for the sake of not travelling for a few weeks. And, you know, wh why, why on earth... I, mean, I can understand people travelling. They'll travel if they can get away with it. But that's why we have governments to control these things. And... Um, it's a bit pathetic. Now, I'm just going to finish on... Um, I've just got some information from the... If I can get the right screen. From the States. I think I think the Janssen, Johnson & Johnson vaccine is not being reviewed in the States till the 23rd of April, as far as I know. So it's like another, what, five days yet. Um, we had hope for a quick response and we were expecting a response last week. So it looks like we're not going to hear anything on this till the 23rd of April. I've got that date slightly wrong, sorry, but it's certainly looking like it's going to be a few days. Now, yesterday I talked about the, the, uh, the rate of portal venous thrombosis after the mRNA vaccines, the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccines. And I just wanted to check to make sure I hadn't got it wrong. So let's just have a quick, let's just have a quick look at that. Because it is, it is really quite, uh, it is really quite incredible when, when we look at this. So um, this, this is this is the this is the paper that we looked at a few days ago. It's the Oxford, Oxford University one, and that's the, that's that's the reference for it. So this is just a direct sort of um, cut and paste I've taken from that. So um, hopefully you can read that. Maybe you don't actually need to, but. Um, so what, what, what they're saying is we reported the, the above, we repeated the above analysis for portal venous thrombosis, which we looked at a few days ago. The absolute incidence in the two weeks after COVID-19 diagnosis was high, uh, 436 per million. So, so that's a lot. This was significantly higher than after influenza, where you get uh, 98.4 cases of portal venous thrombosis per million. Um, uh, or, or after receiving the mRNA vaccines. So this is the bit here. So after receiving the mRNA vaccines from, from this data here, 44.9 uh, cases of, of um, pulmonary venous thrombosis per million. So that, that's what, it's not just me, is it? That's what that data is saying. Okay. Um, and then a bit more information in that. And, and then here it says the incidence of uh, pulmonary venous thrombosis in COVID-19 was also higher than in the reported uh, splenic uh, thrombus by the European Medicines Agency, which, is, as, as we mentioned, is a similar type of blood clot, a similar area of the body, following vaccination with the Oxford vaccine. 
Um, so here there was 53 cases of this splanic uh, thrombosis after 34 million vaccines, which is 1.6 per million. So it seems like they are... They don't seem to be acting on the fact that there's 44.9 um, portal venous thrombosis with the mRNA vaccines here, um, but only 1.6 per million with the Oxford vaccine. So, and typically, I mean, we don't we don't have the the fatality data, but but these portal venous thromboses are are, are fatal after COVID. Certainly, it was about an a over eighteen percent fatality rate with them. So, so um, I mean, I'm I'm not saying these vaccines are good. We have to vaccinate. I believe that, and that's what the national guidelines are. But here we have forty four point nine of this type of blood clot uh, per million, and here we have one point six. Uh, 1.6 per million after the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine. So way more of this type of blood clot in this data reported here after the mRNA vaccines than the adenovirus vector vaccine. And and from memory, um, the from memory the the uh, the prevalence of the uh, the clot that they're worried about in the states, the cerebral sinus venous thrombosis, why they stopped the Johnson and Johnson vaccine. Uh, I think they get. I think they followed out 6.8 million uh, vaccines, and there were six cases. So that was like uh, what 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 one case per uh, 1.2 million. It's not just me that's got that wrong, is it? So 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 they the stopped this because there's 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 one case per 1.2 million vaccines, but they're carrying on with this one with 44.9 cases per million vaccines. Um. I don't get that. I just don't. It, it, they just seem very selective in what they choose to be concerned about. Anyway, when I get called for my next dose of, uh, well, to tell you the truth, I had Pfizer for my first dose, and um, at the moment in the UK we're trying to give the same the same dose twice. But if someone said to me, "Well, there's some spare doses of Oxford vaccine uh, tomorrow," I'd be off like a shot, and I'd have it because I, you know, as far you know. The, the mixing and matching to me doesn't um i mean i'd be i'd be happy to try it let's put it like that um but at the moment we're carrying on with the same with the same one so i'm just looking forward to getting my second shot so what i'm saying is that the, the vaccination programs i believe are essential the government our governments are advising that we have them of course um but they're not without risk but it just seems strange that we're worried about a, a risk of one case per 1.2 million and less worried about a risk with uh, 44.9 cases per million. If you understand the answer to that, let me know. Because I find it a bit strange. Or if anyone from the government wants to come on and explain that, um, I would be, of course, delighted to have them. Because um, you know, that, that's a direct cut and paste from the paper. So just making sure it's not me that's getting it wrong. So if I've got that wrong, let me know. Um, but I don't, can't, I kind of can't see where we've gone wrong on that. So... Yeah, strange, but apparently true. Um, let me know if you know more or if you want to come and talk to me about it, uh, then then please do so. OK, that is us for today. Interest, interesting. Thank you, of course, for watching.